access to public services. What is the purpose of growth if the social gap is increasing? Then you have to refocus your attention from the growth to the distribution. And I think that's a pretty important point which people have to start to understand. It's pretty defensive via the MFF, via the budget, which it's also very consistent with the uh, previous things. So in short, it's a major step in the right direction, which consistency and ambition will be seriously challenged in delivery and practice. So wait for the next documents, and then we will see how far we have actually gone. Now I'm moving to the story which is related to resources. Natural resources have always been in human history closely related to stability, conflicts, and wars. And according to the IRP, to, uh, uh, to our scientific body, in the midterm, except in specific cases, resource shortage will not be the core limiting factor which will force us to change our behavior, but rather it will be environmental and health consequences of that. China did not close 2,000 companies around Beijing few years ago because they were unprofitable, running short of steel or any other resource, but because the use of those resources was polluting the air in the town so much that even a communist government could not ignore that fact. So that's the driver of change. SDGs which are directly dependent on natural resources are basically 12. So when you have changed that slide, uh, you haven't changed it very well because uh, the others were dimmed, yes. Uh, anyway, so it's better to keep the old one. Trade-offs among various SDGs are unavoidable, that's clear, but according to the research which we have done, production and consumption in a sustainable way, it's the best way to mitigate the trade-offs among all those 17 SDGs. So, in short, if you do not change the way you produce and consume, you will never eradicate poverty, never seriously address zero hunger, never fight via climate change and so on. So in essence, we have to go to the basics of how we have organized our societies and economies. Resources which are part of our discussion and analysis, biomass, metals, fossil fuels, and non-metallic minerals, also water and land, but to a lesser extent. And I will share with you just a few basic conclusions from the report which we have produced. The first one, this is on last 50 years of the resource use. The first conclusion is global resource use has more than tripled in the last 50 years. Second, it has almost doubled per capita, which means that the majority of that tripling is connected with economics and not with human population growth. And third, which is quite shocking, material productivity, which is the efficiency of the use of the resources per unit of GDP. That's that black dotted line, was increasing till the year 2000, and then <clears throat> on a global level started to decrease. How is that possible if it is increasing in all the countries? That on a global level is decreasing. A lot of things which you are buying, wearing, have been before produced in resource-efficient countries like Europe, like Japan, like Korea, like United States. And now you are, we are, more and more buying the things which are produced in less resource-efficient countries, like Indonesia, like uh, China, like India. Which means that globally, actually, per capita of GDP, we are using more resources. So, what are the environmental impacts of the value in the value chain of resource extraction and processing phase? That's not yet the use phase. 90% of global biodiversity loss and water stress is connected to that. That's the green part of those. So, if you want to address the biodiversity questions and the water stress questions, it's not possible without going into the essence of food chain and agriculture because that's where the problems lie. It's connected with biomass. Second, 50% of global climate change impacts are connected to that and even one third of the air pollution. So if you are buying your car and you are parking that car for the whole life cycle, you, have, you will never drive it. You have created one third of air pollution because those resources have to be extracted 
and the car needs to be produced. And that's causing pollution, of course. We have also done the modeling in which we assume the resource efficiency, climate mitigation, landscape biodiversity protection and healthy diets and re reduce food waste policies and compare it to the business as usual. And the conclusion is quite uh, astonishing. Even the economic growth, if you go that way, measured in GDP, it's higher than if you go with the approach as we have it now. Because we will sooner or later hit major development, major cost walls with the policies which we currently apply in our economic development. So the concept which we are defending, it's called the coupling concept. We don't, we think that human well-being should, and in many countries uh, should continue even the economic growth in the world, but that we should decouple the growth of that from the growth of resource use, and both should be decoupled from environmental pressures and, and impacts. So uh, when I was a modeler, still uh, a professor of economy, whenever we were lacking uh, the data for GDP, for example, we used as a proxy the data of the growth of energy or any other resource because that was simultaneously going in the same direction. And that's exactly what should stop and should finish. So Green Deal is based on the circular economy and circular economy should be seen as an instrument for delivering the coupling of economic growth from resource use and environmental impacts and also as part of a bigger picture of economic, societal and cultural transformation. So the misunderstanding that circular economy is very much linked to the resource um, to, the, um, uh, to the recycling, it's still, still, still too much present. But I will explain you later why that is wrong. Now we are going to the third part, which is resource efficiency and climate change. This is a report which was released by the IRP just two months ago. And where we tried to prove that it's not enough if you look it only through the energy, but you have to look it also through the resources if you want to deal with the climate story. The impact, the share of production of materials on total GHG is through the time increasing. 15%, 90, 95, 23, 2015. Materials production, it's hard to abate fully through electrification and energy efficiency. Using materials more efficiently down the value chain, it's most direct measure to reduce these emissions. And the technologies are available already today. Measures to decarbonize materials industries are either on the supply side, which are normally the ones which we use and know, and or on demand side, material efficiency design, the choice of low carbon light weight materials, yield improvements in ma manufacturing and recovery and so on. This side is practically not present in any of the NDCs or in any approach which we are using currently to fight climate change. We were concentrating on housing and on the cars as examples. Why? You, because they are using large amounts of material, providing essential services to society, creating high economic value, and also showing uh, significant potential to increase efficiency. By the way, we also had good data there, which it's normally the best reason why you go in that direction. So a uh, report is assessing seven crucial material efficiency strategies using less material by design, material substitution, fabrication yield improvements, more intensive use, product lifetime extension, recovery, remanufacturing, reuse of components, and finally, enhanced end-of-life recovery and recycling of materials. And now the results. The results are, we have measured them for G7 countries and specifically for China and India separately. So they are not for global world, but G7 and China and India. That's 2016 the reality of, uh, of the homes, so houses. These are the estimates which are done by IPCC, their most ambitious modeling. So that's how they assume that with their policies they will cut GHG by 2050. 
And we have just tested, if we add material policies, what it happens. And you can cut additionally the emissions for 35% in G7 countries. If we go to China and India, this is much more. Actually, you get the result that you can additionally cut GAG for 60%. So if you would go reverse, if you would test on that, first material, material related policies, of course, those effects in absolute figures would be much higher than actually we are seeing here. But we just wanted to prove that if you combine the two policies, you basically get much better results. Which are the most important policy strategies? More intensive use, which is not a surprise. So in housing, and also as you will see later in the car, the problem is that we built a lot, that we buy a lot, but then we don't use them intensively enough. In the emission cars in G7 countries, uh, that's how it should look in uh, 2050. And if you add material policies, material efficiency policies and strategies, additional 30%. Here, when it comes to China and India, of course, due to the their level of development, we are, it's assumed that, the, that th this will still grow because the amount of cars they will use will be growing much comparing to the situation now. And you can cut it with materials approach for 35%. So that's a typical European story. European car, it's 92% parked, 5% it's driving, 1.6% it's looking for parking, 1% it's sitting in congestion, and if we assume that it's uh, in the five-seater only at average 1.5 person, the utility of privately owned car today in Europe is 2%. So if you really want to solve the problem of mobility in Brussels, take one simple decision today. In 15 years, during inside the ring, there will not be allowed to use private car. You will solve all the problems with one decision in 15 years. But if you say it now, you will have mushrooming of innovation, ideas, alternative solutions, because we humans re react on alternative solutions. Don't take something from us give us something in different way, then it's possible. <laughs> According to the results which we have done, you can, you can see that car sharing and ride sharing have the major potential in, in when it comes to the, to the cars. So this is uh, cumul uh, cumul uh, cumulative savings in both sectors. Uh, you can look to the, to the overall report, so I will not go to the detail. These are some existing sectoral policy approaches which offer leverage points. Uh, first are for buildings, the second are for transportation policies. Since the whole analysis was done in United States, they are focused on United States examples. And then there are some policies which are cross-cutting across the actors, uh, sectors. Sorry, Government use of building certification systems, green public procurement, Virgin material taxation, removal of virgin resource subsidies, recycled content mandates, and all that should become part of the NDCs because all that is not part of NDCs. So in short, uh, this is detailed sectoral modeling of this first report. It's basically focusing on cars and on houses. In essence, you need to look to the mobility and housing, and then you get the real improvements because it's not just how different car you have and how differently you use it it's how you organize the whole mobility it's not just how you improve the efficiency of the house but how you connect the knots in the cities how you better organize the things which is not yet in that but it should be and we should go in that direction so to summarize if we look into the supply side solutions, that is exactly what currently the climate policy is. Then we look to the carbon management and energy. But if you would imagine the situation in which you would have abundant energy, cheap energy, all renewable energy, but the current models and systems of consumption in housing, in mobility, in food production, 
you can easily imagine that we have not solved yet the climate change problems. So you need to connect it, that policies with the coupling policies of land, water, materials, and on the top of that, the third pillar is the pillar of ecosystem services, environmental things. The current, envir the current climate policy is orange and a bit of green. But there is a major potential in green and a major potential in blue. So if you want a zero carbon Europe 2050, it will not be possible without the full picture. Finally, I'm going to the circular economy, where to focus our attention. The core thinking switch which needs to come, it's linked to the, from quantity-driven profits to consumer needs. We do not need cars, we need mobility. We do not need light bulbs, we need the light. We don't need chairs, we need to sit. We don't need refrigerators, we need chilled and healthy food. We don't need CDs, we want to listen to the music. We don't need pesticides, we want healthy plants. And I can continue and continue. So it's actually about dematerialization, rethinking ownership, and moving from efficiency to sufficiency. If I give you just one example of the light bulb. If somebody is selling you a light bulb, he creates the profit by selling you as many light bulbs as possible. If he or she is selling you the light, the light bulbs which he needs to use for that are his cost. So the system is incentivizing producer to use less materials to pollute less. Until we have the system, and the whole economy is driven in that way today still, that it's quantity driven, more, 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 it's better, better, better. Until we have that system, which we then try to remedy with legislation, it will not work. So we basically need to change incentives to the economic actors, to producers and to consumers. One thing which is also important to be uh, addressed in the future, that's how it looks today. Producer is responsible for the product until it's produced, consumer until it's consumed, used, and when it's becoming a waste, it's actually society which is responsible. How the society organizes that, it's up to the society. But in essence, the link between the producer and the product, it's lost. So connecting, retaining the value of the product and connecting the responsibility of the, pro of the producer for the product which he or she has produced, it's, it's extremely important. This chair, this table, nothing would look the same if producer would know that it will get it back on his courtyard because now it's just producing it and then responsibility is in the hands of others. It will, have, it will contain less chemicals. It will be designed differently. You don't need eco-design if you connect producer better with the product because he will be interested in eco-design. So changing the incentives is the core of the story. We need to move from waste policy to the product policy that waste framework directive is based on, as you know, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle, recover, uh, and then dispose. And if we are entirely honest, this is, by the way, already in today's legislation, we have done nothing really on reduce. We were more or less focusing, even today, even the figures which were presented before were on this part. Yeah? So we need to move from end of pipe to the whole life cycle, which means to the product. Product framework legislation, from waste hierarchy to product hierarchy, product value retention system, end of product status, product producer ownership concept, design of sustainability requirements, public procurement requirements, product passport, registration for market access, all that are serious questions. How to avoid the waste? Because when you have the waste, the materials have already been used, even if, of course, reusing them is better than not reusing them. The second part on which we will have to focus is connected to food and land systems. According to Food and Land Use Coalition, hidden costs of the global food and land system are higher than actually the market value of the global food and land system. So you can see here, health, environmental, economic, food system value, not hidden cost. This is the net value. 
and uh, they have proposed 10 measures which are from digital revolution, stronger rural livelihood, gender demography, diversifying protein supply, reducing food losses, waste, local loops, linkages, productive regenerative agriculture, protecting, restoring nature, healthy productive ocean, healthy diets, and all that with economic priced investment requirements and business opportunity which was hidden behind. So my question really is, would we need in Europe something which would be EU 2050 sustainable land use roadmap? We don't have something like that. Maybe some of you know the destiny of the soil directive, which is as it is, uh, or better, which was as it was. But when it comes to land, you should never forget the Mark Twain statement, by land they are not making it anymore. So land is the most limited natural resource, most limited. And if you look uh, through the biodiversity angle, now it's the idea that uh, we should increase the protected areas to 30% currently, because we are in CBD year. Currently, it's 18% in Europe. In the Green Deal, you will find the sentence the new EU forest strategy will have as its key objective effective of forestation and forest preservation and restoration in Europe. All fine, but again, we talk about additional land. Agricultural needs for productive land to sustain the security of food provisions, again, additional land. Trends prevailing in increasing use of biomass for energy production, which are currently present, additional land. Then European Union high-speed uh, network, again, additional land, if you follow what is happening in UK, this is the major political story today. Then electricity interconnected targets to quote again the document of commission to achieve its climate energy goals. Europe needs to improve cross-border electricity interconnections. And you know the story of urban sprawl, continuous pressure existing from urban to rural migration. If you ask any question horizontally, sectorally, you will get a positive answer because it's needed and it's good. But if you ask it together, there is no such land existing. So we, we need to seriously discuss this food land story in a connected way, which is currently not existing. Digitalization will be really important. From the first law of technology, technology is neither good nor bad, nor it's neutral. We have to make it good. Digital will lead to massive improvements in efficiency, provisions of goods and services. But it could be either a push to linear and consumption or a push to a circular. So digital transformation can and should be a major part of the solution in the transition to a more sustainable economy and society. And thus, it is urgent political task to create conditions needed to place digitalization at the service of sustainable development. And by itself, ICT sector should target to become carbon neutral because it's becoming higher and higher problem. By the way, the data storage today in the world consumes, creates more GHG than the whole uh, transportation by the air. Integrate circular economy digitalization with competitiveness. This is very effective thing if we understand that in Europe, for most of the critical resources, we are import dependent, that prices of resources in the long term are increasing, in short term they are at least volatile, and that the share of costs, according to German data which I have, for the resources, it's increasing in the companies while the share for labor is decreasing. So it's pretty obvious where we can search for our competitiveness. And if you take into consideration also social issues, because we are living in Europe, which has social consideration very high on the agenda, we have to remember that resources will not go on the street and protest, which is easier. And finally, digital as a main driver to that. So connect the things. All the levels do matter. That's why your meeting is so important. Why cities and regions are so important? Because you have relative autonomy of the governance. And many of the things are concentrated with opportunities and problems on your level. So in many cases, you should do a lot, even without the governmental or global policies. Then governments should also, of course, push that through that system and finally international and global level. So to conclude that I don't get into real troubles. There are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. In 
So there is a major importance of creating the critical mass of science, which can hardly be disregarded by politicians and policymakers. And that's what we have to work together. According to WEF, the challenge seems not to be of inadequate scientific evidence anymore. It's rather the one of cooperation and implementation. Complexity and scale of these challenges requires new forms of collaboration and more systemic approaches. So if I use the circularity term, we need, even in a global governance, more, more uh, sharing instead of owing. Sharing of sovereignty instead of owing sovereignty. By the way, European Union is the best example of that in good and bad. So we learned a lot in these uh, decades when we are sharing sovereignty in many areas. And uh, this was done with a sole simple purpose to avoid conflicts and wars. So if we want to avoid conflicts and wars globally in the future, sharing sovereignty will be a must. That's why Brexit is such a tragical, tragical development.